Uh, let's start with some prayer and jump right into, and yet still another deep dive. And uh, <laughs> I'm having a lot of fun doing this. I hope um, you enjoy this too. Let's pray. Father God, would you speak to us tonight as we as we look to your word, that we would see the coming of Jesus as, as advertised in the scripture, as the blessed hope, as a good thing. And Lord, we have all come from different backgrounds and heard different things. Um, but we want your spirit to speak to us. And help help us to just clarify and come to maybe a different place of understanding uh, of these things. And we bless you. I pray that you would lead me and guide me, that your spirit would be in our midst tonight. We need you, Jesus. And we love you. We bless you. And everybody said, amen. 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 Um, I bought a book. Uh, well, let me let me read some things, and I'll tell you about this book. Um, why do this? Um, and I'm going through some some of the old uh, slides that I did. Again, it's important to understand the times that we're living in, and it speaks in the Old Testament and Chronicles about the men of Issachar who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. 200 chiefs with all their relatives under their command. Um, Jesus also told us that we need to understand the times. Now, he, here in Matthew 16, he's speaking to um, his disciples and um, people that were surrounding him and listening to him, and he's speaking to that uh, first century crowd, and he says, um, there's really, you know, there's, I'm doing a new thing, um, He's been teaching and declaring the kingdom of God. Uh, and a lot of people are just not getting it. A lot of people are understanding, but many are not getting it. And he says, you need to really dial in and, and pay attention uh, to the times. When evening comes, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. <clears throat> you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Um, and that is one of the things, you know, that I in, am endeavoring to do better. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading in eschatology over the last four or five years, really going back even further. Um, I was uh, pleasantly surprised on the way here, uh, chatting with Terry about some of the books that we have read uh, that... Uh, uh, such as Gary Gentry's book, When Jerusalem Fell. I've been, I was raised in, in, in what we have defined as the kind of classic dispensationalism, uh, the idea that uh, we are to anticipate uh, a period of time which people have been predicting and talking about and anticipating where things really uh, start to get progressively worse. It's generally a pessimistic outlook, uh, and we have been more focused on uh, I, the identification of an antichrist than, than really the blessed hope. Um, I, I want to back up and say that I'm not going to cover everything that I covered in the first two deep dives. I did a deep dive on a Saturday, I think, and then we came back and did another hour on a Sunday. Um, today, I'm, I'm going to delve deeper into the, the question of this so-called seven-year tribulation at the end of the age. Uh, not everybody believes it's the literal seven years, but most people who hold to an end-time tribulational period believe um, that it is something that is the, the Bible teaches. But again, uh, what is eschatology? The, it's a word <clears throat> that is derived from a Greek word, which is in the Bible. We'll see it a few times tonight during our reading. I'm sweating so much up here. My glasses are fogging. Where, where is your pack? <laughs> I think you're mashing the, the 
I'm mashing it. It's in my pocket. Where should it be? In my sweatshirt. Okay, there we go. All right. All right. So that's just so you know, that's not my stomach. That's. <laughs> we're going, wow, Ralph, you really put on weight. Um, so eschatology, again, is the study of the last things or the end times, a significant component of Christian theology. And for the average modern churchgoer, having a rudimentary understanding of eschatology can be vital uh, for several reasons. I covered some of these. I, I don't want to go over all of that stuff again. Um, but at, my hope is to <coughs> communicate a more hopeful eschatology. Uh, and um, I think that's good. <laughs> you know, even from a strictly you know, non-religious standpoint, psychologists tell us that optimistic people tend to have better mental health. And they're, they're reported to be healthier than their less cheerful counterparts. Uh, and I, I know I live with such a person. I'm a glass half full kind of guy who lives with a, 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 no, half empty, the other way around, right? I'm a half empty guy. You're a half full. Kathy's cup is actually overflowing. Her cup <laughs> and I, I was going to say, I, I was... Um, reading a, a really interesting book uh, that I downloaded on Audible. And uh, it's written by a guy named J.D. King, and the foreword was written by Bill Johnson. And the title of the book is Why You've Been Duped into Believing That the World is Getting Worse. Really interesting statistics. He's a, a pastor out of Kansas City who started looking into things like, you know, is hunger really increasing? Uh, are more and more people, um, uh, is it true that, uh, that there's fewer people getting medical care and more sickness and all the gloomy statistics that our media loves to pump down our throats? Um, it's just unbelievable. You know, I, I was listening to KNX uh, driving around the other day, and they, they, they love to turn everything into a crisis. And, and it, it's just, you know, there's, there was a demonstration somewhere in, in Los Angeles and they were interviewing some guy who was talking about how bad it is for inner city businesses. You know, they're being, um, they're being devastated by, you know, the, the, the looting. And, and you would think, you know, it's true, you know, that there is a lot of that going on. But he, he started to... He started to use this terminology like, you know, he said something like, businesses are being desecrated. I said, Des how do you desecrate a business? And, 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 the, and, and the way that he was describing everything that's going on, um, it just kind of, it, it left me, you know, just slightly depressed, right? When in fact, um, the truth is that probably crime statistics have, are probably, have, are dropping, but we hear about the sort of more dramatic stuff because it sells a new, it sells. It just sells better. It draws more, more interest and more clicks and, and so forth. But anyway, if, if, you want, if you want to find out more about all this stuff, get this book, uh, J.D. King, Why You've Been Duped Into Believing the World Is Getting Worse. Anyway, so I hope after today that your general outlook on eschatology in the Bible will be better. Let me get... Let me, let me move on here. So, um, um, what is the end that we're looking for? Well, the, 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 our eschatological outlook is the return of Jesus. Billy Graham said this, uh, the end will come with the return of Jesus. That's why a Christian can be an optimist. Th that is why a Christian can smile in the midst of all that is happening. We know what the end will be, the triumph of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're not just waiting passively for Jesus. We've been given the Holy Spirit. We've, we've, we've been in the book of Acts um, uh, in this, this week. In fact, I'll be dealing with the uh, Acts chapter 2, I think, right? Acts chapter 2, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So because the Holy Spirit has been poured out, that's my cause for hope. Not, I don't 
And my cause for hope isn't that politics or you know politicians are going to get it all right, or that we're going to have more police. Those things are great, and you know we 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 want that. My um, reason for hope is because the Holy Spirit is active in the world today, and because the Holy Spirit is active in the world today, He is actively ushering in the kingdom of God, and it, it's, nothing's going to stop it. Uh, nothing's going to stop that. The kingdom, his kingdom, as, as we're told in Daniel 2, in Daniel 4, in Isaiah 9, is an ever-increasing kingdom. And so we're looking for things to get better, right? Because of, because of the Holy Spirit, because of the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, and, you know, that's Bible. The, this is the blessed hope. The grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. I don't know why I didn't have the the uh, address of this verse. It's I think this is Titus, Titus two, something like that. The grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what I'm going to put forth today is this very thing. I believe that the return of Jesus is imminent. I I believe, and I didn't always believe this, is why I'm incredibly broad-minded and merciful to people who disagree with me on this. Uh, I hope that they would also change, but I... I firmly believe that nothing else has to be fulfilled in the prophetic calendar before the return of Jesus. That the, that the Lord, and I'm going to try to show that from Scripture, that the Lord Jesus could return at any moment. He could come as we're sitting here studying the Scripture tonight, and, and that's, that's our blessed hope. I dug deeply into that, um, into, well, let me, let me go on. Yeah. So I don't have a preface for my preface. Uh, I tend to do that. Um, Anyway, understanding eschatology gives us a foundation for hope and assurance. I'm just going to go through all these very quickly. I read these. Uh, I encourage you to, if you weren't part of the first two deep dives, uh, listen to the two deep dives. Um, Understanding eschatology helps us to overcome fear. Understanding eschatology strengthens our faith. It deepens our worship and devotion. Uh, all of those things are, are an important reason why we need an eschatology of hope. Um, that said, um, some, some caveats here. As a vineyard church, we don't divide over eschatological differences. Although, you know, I know a lot of vineyard pastors are very firm in what they believe. Um, and um, folks are all over the map. <laughs> I'm going to talk about some of these positions uh, later on. But we don't, we don't make it a, uh, it's not a make or break thing as in some other uh, traditions where to be a pastor, say, in, in a Calvary Chapel movement church, uh, you have to pretty much sign off on, on the pre-trib rapture uh, and, and some other things too. Um, that's not the case um, uh, typically within the vineyard. Um, also, beware of end-of-the-world paranoia, especially now in the midst of what's unraveling in, in the Middle East. Um, yes, it's pretty scary. Yes, um, radical Islam is uh, rearing its ugly head. Uh, yes, there are a lot of horrible things happening. I was reading about some of those things. Christians that are uh, being slaughtered in Nigeria. Um, our, our dear friend missionary Kathy Crooks um, knows of and the people that are living in Mozambique are experiencing the uh, radical um, uh, attacks or the attacks by by I, I forget the name of the Boca some Boca Haram, Boca Haram not Boca Rosa not Boca Raton that's <laughs> um, anyway um, these kind of things you know end of the world paranoia sells a lot of books. And, and these sorts of books that come out that, you know, where some individual looks into a verse in the Old Testament and then 
says, I found the key for, you know, how the end of the world is going to come. And they put out a book and all of a sudden they have speaking engagements and they're all over the internet. And I'm not going to name any names, but I'm thinking of several folks that are like that. And they, you know, they're, they're very interesting books. There might be some truth to them. Um, you know, as we're, we've been raised in the vineyard to chew the meat and spit out the bones. Um, but we've, we've, it, it just really saps the evangelistic fervor and energy when we're focused on these kind of things. We were talking about this on the way here, too. We had a really interesting conversation. And we mentioned this last time, um, that it's not the way the Jesus movement began. The Jesus movement was a movement of embracing everyone, opening the door, sharing Jesus, loving on people, uh, discipling people, and then all of a sudden, the eschatology, the kind of toxic ex- eschatology came in, and we shifted. I remember when that happened to me. I went from being somebody who talked to everybody, who shared Jesus openly, to collecting books about the rapture, and all the different positions, and arguing with people about it, and getting angry about it. and It, it really... So I'm coming from a place of you know, just a lot of, if you probably are not like me in that way, I mean, I, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so what I'm going to present may be new to most of you, although I was really um, surprised at how deeply Terry has read into these kind of things, and um, he's got a lot of great books that he's going to share with me too. Um, so I only want to process this and hopefully uh, encourage you to do some more reading. Um, So, here we go. This is what we've already covered. I talked about the Olivet Discourse, which begins not in chapter 24. It actually starts in chapter 23, when Jesus pronounces the woes on on the Pharisees and scribes. And, And then it continues. Remember those chapter breakdowns weren't there. There were no chapters and verses. It was just all, you know, if you look at that part of your Bible, there's a lot of red letter stuff in there. So it begins in chapter 23, goes all the way to chapter 25. Um, But I most, I think I stopped, I stopped pretty much at around verse uh, 30, 31. And I'm going to take it up a little bit later uh, with, um, I believe, this, this critical place there in the Olivet Discourse. And, and we need to understand the flow of the Olivet Discourse and what Jesus is saying about the abomination of desolation and his quoting of Daniel 9 uh, in order to understand the timing of that. So is it something that we're, that's coming? The abomination of desolation, is it future or is it in the past? And I'm going to argue that it's in the past. Um, so some questions of timing. Um, and I, I, I spoke about this and I quoted a lot of first century Christians, uh, early Christians, uh, prominent Christians on the question of, of Antichrist. Uh, and I, again, I'm not going to jump into this in depth again. It's in those first two videos in depth. But in a nutshell, the man of sin, I, and I, you know, I think I gave a pretty strong argument, was Nero Caesar. Um, and the, the mentions of Antichrist and spirit of Antichrist, I quoted verses from 1 John, and I believe that I, I, I argued pretty successfully to conclude that the spirit of Antichrist was being uh, kind of communicated through false teachings. Primarily there were two main false teachings that were going on in the first century. Uh, One of them is Gnosticism, that all of the apostles seem to be addressing one way or the other in their epistles. And the other one was the the false teaching of legalism, that that a Christian has to go through all of the ceremonial law and so forth. Uh, These were the things that really were being addressed by the disciples. What about the rapture? I, again, I I will talk a little bit more about this. When is it? What does the Bible say? Uh, In a nutshell, I see this 
as happening simultaneously with the second coming. And I'll, we'll, we'll delve into that and look at what the scripture says. This is the part that I'm going to be more focused in tonight. What about the so-called 70 weeks of Daniel in uh, Daniel uh, chapter 9 and what some call the, the, um, the 70 weeks really the most Christians, most evangelicals believe that 69 of those weeks Many believe 70 weeks. I believe 70 weeks have been fulfilled. Many believe only 69 are, have been fulfilled. And there's one future unfulfilled week or Shabuah, a seven-year period that's still to come. We're going to look into that. What does the Bible say? Um, Revelation 20, I'm not going to even touch tonight. Uh, just to mention that this is where the different uh, millennial positions uh, come from. And here, here's four views. Um, it's really, if you're at home watching the screen, I don't know if Robin, if you can zoom in a little bit more, but um, most uh, Christians today fall into one of these categories with regard to the millennial reign, the thousand year reign. Uh, I believe that to be literal. And that's, in, that's chapter 20 of the book of Revelation. I believe that Jesus will return to earth in any moment. And the next thing that will happen is the start of this millennial reign. I think it's literally a thousand years. It doesn't necessarily have to be a thousand years. It could just be a very long period of time. But he, the Bible talks a lot about that. We're going to cover some of this today, but not so much. That'll be the next deep dive, really, is Revelation 20. So you're in that, post, you're in that historic pre-millennial I am a kind of a Interesting, yeah, I'm a historic pre-mill. Christ will return physically and visibly to usher in the millennial reign. I'm a millennialist, and there's many, many within our own tradition um, in the vineyard, many within the Reformed tradition, believe that this current church age is actually the millennial reign. It's an interesting position. They argue very convincingly for it. It's possible that they're right. I think it's true in some sense because Jesus is reigning. He's seated in his heavenly throne. He's ruling and reigning from heaven. He is conducting a war against the powers and principalities of this present age. And the Bible says he must reign until he has put all those enemies under his feet. But I don't hold to uh, the kind of strict... Uh, amillennialism that because an amillennialist believes that we're in the thousand years it, they spiritualize that I'm not uh, being um, what's the word I'm not ridiculing that in any sense of the word uh, I'm saying that that's the position that they hold that we're in this millennial reign and then the next thing that will happen is the uh, some hold that there will be a, an end time tribulation still ahead a great um, revival among Jewish people. I actually hold to that. I think there's room for that because of the teaching of Romans 11. But again, for another deep dive, there's so many potential deep dives. <laughs> right? Um, anyway, then there's post-millennialists. <clears throat> post-millennialists hold that the church, and that's another interesting position that's kind of gaining a following that the church, the influence of the church will grow and grow as the kingdom expands, as the ministry of the Holy Spirit continues uh, to such a degree that it will, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord. Um, some who hold to the so-called seven mountains perspective believe this. They, they hold a kind of a post-millennialist position that the, 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 church, the influence of the church will grow. It's quite possible that post-millennialists could be right. It was a very popular position in the late 1800s and the early 1900s because it looked that way. The world was getting better and better, more and more missions, activity. Um, uh, churches were revivals. in revivals. Churches were, were doing a lot of you know, social work and influencing the, the, the society. And then World War I. And really it was the pessimism and, and the, all of the kind of gloominess that came in 
with the, you know, it was called the Ward and All Wars that um, sort of boosted the dispensationalist views that began to become more and more prominent. The idea that, no, we're heading into the end times, things are going to get worse and worse, and then the Antichrist is going to be revealed. And this, this increased, again, uh, because of World War II. Many believers uh, saw, and this is a really interesting thing, uh, believers considered that Hitler was the Antichrist. Many Christians became passive about engaging Hitler and opposing Hitler in any way because they said, this is inevitable, this is what God is doing. So this is the kind of downside to giving in to pessimism. Um, thank God, you know, for people like um, um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and others, you know, who resisted um, very, very laid his life down. Laid his life down and he wasn't alone. Uh, and then there's dispensationalism. So these are the four kind of views of the end times with regards to the thousand year reign. Uh, dispensationalists believe similar to the historic pre-mill people, that the millennial reign of Christ will begin after his return uh, at the end of a distinct seven-year period known as the tribulation. So for me, I'm going to argue tonight that I, I hold to all of that, except where I don't think, I think the tribulation is past. And I'm going to take the very verses that they use, such as um, Jeremiah 30, uh, the, the, the so-called time of Jacob's trouble, that they throw 2,000 years into the future, or more like 2,500 years. And anyway. So dispensationalism, they're saying that, that you have the seven-year tribulation, and then Christ returns. Correct. Our 2,000 yeah. Well, yeah. Christ the question, I'm sorry. You know, why don't we put that microphone on the table so when somebody has a really good question like that, it can be heard. Cheryl just asked, uh, do dis would dispensationalists believe that first, uh, that on the prophetic calendar, there's going to be a seven-year tribulation, and then Christ returns? Yes, they believe that. Um, okay, next slide. Um, I, I've spoken a little bit about this. This is more kind of an in-depth, uh, you know, graphic pr uh, presentation of uh, these millennial positions, post-millennialists. Again, they, um, let me get down here and point to these things. Um, this is the Jesus' first coming, um, separated by this church age, um, which they look at the church age, they equate to the millennium. That we're in it now. And then the second coming, and then this new heavens and new, uh, new earth that pretty much every, um, every, every millennialist position holds to because it's pretty clear in the Bible. Premillennialists, these are some premillennialists because I, I, I embrace all of this with the exception of this apostasy, tribulation, antichrist, Possibly Armageddon is, is somewhere here. I don't know that. That's something that we won't have time to talk about tonight. But this apostasy, I think I showed my perspective on it during the deep dives, happened uh, in the first and second centuries. Um, Antichrist, we already talked about Antichrist uh, being pretty clearly Nero Caesar. Um, the, the 666 equates to that. It's probably the, the strongest argument for 666, that, it's, that if, you, if you do that, uh, you know, you take the, the, letter, the numbers and the Greek letters that correspond, it, it basically spells out Nero Caesar as the man of sin. Um, and then uh, the second coming followed by the millennium. Yeah, yeah, microphone. <laughs> question, Cheryl has a question. So how do you reconcile, I get the apostasy, tribulation, and antichrist from last time. How do you reconcile the Armageddon? Um, I think, you know, we, I, I mentioned that to you. It's, 
Um, it's possible that Armageddon, I, and I'm still learning about this. Okay, all right. Um, I'm not so sure that it's something that has to happen before the second coming. But I'm, I'm kind of ambivalent about that. Okay, because I always thought, I always think of Armageddon as the battle of Gog and Magog. Is that not, is it, that an incorrect assumption? Most, most premillennialists separate the two. Oh, do they? Okay. Yeah, and they All talk right. about Gog and Magog as the great battle that occurs at the end of the, uh, this is mentioned in, um, in Revelation 20. I wish I could just pull up that verse and read it. Um, but there's, there's, a, there's a rebellion by the nations against the, the rule and reign of Christ on the earth, which is put down with finality. And then the, the eternal state. Why would anybody want to rebel against someone who's been ruling like that? But it just, I think it's one of the ways that, um, you know, you see the, the um, sort of, you know, power of, you know, sin and rebellion at work. But it's fine, you know, the, the, that battle is mentioned in Revelation 20. Um, so there's some differences here. Wait, this is completely... Get the microphone so they can hear you. This is completely... I didn't, come to, I didn't come prepared to talk about Armageddon and Gog and Magog, but we, we will maybe for the next deep dive. Okay. Yeah. All right, this is this is completely not <laughs> had to do with anything with a timeline. This is just how how anybody here sees people. Because obviously Jesus ruling on the earth is going to be the most positive thing that's ever happened to the world, right? There's perfect justice now. Yeah. And there's all these things going right. Now, we know from the scripture that it says that Jesus came to the world, but men love darkness. More they than, love their darkness yeah. but more than the light. And so there are going to be some people that still will hold on to the darkness and still give way to deception. But do you, but do you think that that is like a really small percentage? Like, I mean, isn't it natural for a human being to love what's good, to... To love, love, to love what's... Um, well, it says in, in if, um, if you have a Bible in answer to your question and, and open it to Revelation 20, now that we're kind of there. going there, you know, we're not bound to me finishing these notes. Uh, um, uh, we got to... And I, you know, feel free to push back, by the way. I'm not up here pontificating you know, that I'm right on this thing, and, and you might convince me otherwise. Um, these are the kind of things where we have to just be good Bereans, you know, and look up stuff. But it says in chapter 20 of the book of Revelation um, that when the thousand years are completed, verse 7 of Revelation 20, Satan will be released from his prison. So remember the, the, the millennial reign begins with the binding of Satan. Um, our millennialists believe that he's bound now. Like and they, it. hang on, in, 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 they have very powerful arguments for their belief that Satan is bound. They, they, they define bound as limited. Now there's some comfort in that, you know, if you believe that, that Satan can't do everything that he wants to do. So oh, if... Yeah. It, What's that, Laura? Satan's always limited. He's always limited. Yes. The creator God is always above him. Yeah, he is. Right. Yeah. And, but what I'm saying is, you know, that things could be worse. Right? <laughs> if not for God's active. So anyway, that's, but that's a good point, Laura. If Satan is bound because, as they say, he can't do everything that he really wants, then what difference is there, Right? Between, you know, any, any millennial perspective, right? In, in the, the language of chapter 20 is that he is taken and he is thrown uh, into, yeah, it says in verse 2 of chapter 20, um, a, an angel comes down from heaven having the key of the abyss and a great chain, 20 verse 1. 
This is the start of the millennial reign. And he lays hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who's the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And that term, a thousand years, is repeated six times in this chapter, which why I tend to believe it's literal, but who knows? Yeah. Who knows? And What's that? An angel yeah, very powerful. Probably Michael. I know, but it wasn't even God who did it. I mean, God probably sent the angel. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. it was just an angel. It wasn't an angel bound Satan. Yeah, yeah. that's what's interesting about okay. Revelation. Sometimes you don't know if it's the angel of the Lord, oh, I so. meaning okay. Jesus himself. Okay. But I don't think so in this case. Satan was an angel. Yeah, right. yeah. And, and there's angels that are equally powerful. Um, anyway, and so it's a period of time when the Lord says, you no longer have free will to do whatever you want. And he's, he's limited. Uh, and then in verse 8, after he's loosed, he's released from his prison. Why he's released? I don't know. Maybe the Lord is trying to show something here. That even in the most, you know, you can have the most ideal, perfect justice being met it, you know, being um, a dealt <laughs> um, and the most perfect uh, ruler and still, you know, sinful people will, will rebel against that. And it says in verse 8, he'll come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. So the Gog and Magog are the nations of the earth to gather them together for, for the war and the number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. So is there a difference between that and, and the battle that's described that takes place in the plains of Megiddo or Armageddon? Um, some argue that it's the same. Kathy, I don't know if I answered your question. Oh, the, the question had nothing to do with Although I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that we read this because I, I guess I was so blown away the last time that... Are they hearing what you're saying? No. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah. I, um... Well, I, I uh, love verse 6 where it says, Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. For them the second death... Oh, wait, sorry. I want to... I think it does, it does tell me because it does, you did answer it because I was like, why would anybody after Jesus been reigning a thousand years, like, like want the evil, want, you know, agree with the devil. But it's like, he's, he's been bound yeah, and now he's loose to deceive again. So there's going yeah. to come this very, very dark demonic deception that those that aren't really you know, grounded in the Lord will, or, or unsaved will fall for. I mean, I think that speaks right? to the, the, no. the, the level of deception of the enemy, David. Absolutely. And, and what I see there is that, is that what it speaks to is the, the destructive power of a lie. Mm. And, and when I think, what is Satan really lying about. He's lying about the nature and character of who God is. Mm. And that's how he gathers as many people, the sands of the sea to yeah. come against yeah. Jesus and the believers. Yeah. What? And, and I think this is what Tolkien had in mind in The Lord of the Rings. You know, there, there's very similar battles to right. this. And it's the lust for power. Right. And what happens, you know, when people are tempted with, um, with infinite power. But I uh, think one of the things, I just, but I totally want you to get into Daniel 9. So I just want yeah, to let's say, go, let's say go. this and then, and then let it rest. <laughs> but uh, verse 5 to me is so fascinating. This is the first resurrection. The rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years had ended. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. So it is a reward for Christi Christians. Yeah. So people who die outside, I mean, especially, yeah, especially I the a, martyred ones. That's I have what a perspective saying. on that too, that um, 
yeah, you know, at the end of this thousand years, it's pretty clear that there would be the general resurrection that all, you know, the Jewish people also hold to. And, and then we'll stand before God, you know, the so-called white throne judgment. But I think that a lot of people are going to go into this millennial reign, given that I don't see this, the, all the devastations of the book of Revelation, I see them as, as uh, apocalyptic language that's already fulfilled. So that a lot of people on planet Earth are going to survive right. the, the period of his return right. and go into the millennial reign. Right. And so it's not just going to be resurrected Christians. Right. And if that's not the case, then why are there so-called nations which seemingly are not subjected to the lordship of Jesus? Who are these nations then? So clearly not everyone's forced. You know, This isn't like Islam where you're being forced at the tip of a sword to convert. There's still free will and choice. All right, so the question is, are we in the last days now? Um, and, and this is, again, you know, a, a very, very common, very popular question these days and has been, I think, really for the last 50 years. Are we in the last days? What, what, um, what does the Bible say? And there's New Testament evidence that points to the fact that the disciples believed they were living in the last days. These are just six verses, uh, passages of Scripture that I picked out. And the question is, were they right? Or, as many dispensationalist teachers who throw many of the events of Revelation and um, and really biblical prophecy into that seven-year, any moment now, period of time that's going to come upon the earth, where, where the disciples and even Jesus confused? That's the question. Because here's what they said. Peter said, and you know, this is going to be somebody's sermon pretty soon. These people are not drunk. As some of you are assuming, 9 o'clock in the morning is much too early. Not much, but much. Um, that M was kind of... <laughs> no. <laughs> what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, in the word, in the Greek there is eschatos, where we get eschatology. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will, what? Dream dreams. Somehow I chopped off that verse. So you see, Peter saying, this is that. What you're experiencing is the promise that the last days Are are here. Right? So they were, they were laboring under that understanding. This is scripture. This is Holy Spirit inspired scripture. First Peter 1.20, God chose him, Jesus, as your ransom long before the world began, but he has now revealed him to you in these last eschatos days. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 10.11, these things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us me and you, Corinthians, in 50 AD, who live, when? At the end of the age. So I'm saying Jesus and the disciples believed that the end of the age began with the coming, the ministry of Jesus, with his announcement, repent and believe the kingdom of God is at hand, is here. Uh, The author of Hebrews, long ago God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets, has now in these eschatos days, final days, he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance, and through the son he created the universe. So, author of Hebrews, James, uh, the half-brother of Jesus, your gold and silver are corroded, their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. He's speaking to people in the first century. In John, in 1 John, dear children, this is the last aura that literally transliterated the the word in Spanish that we get also into Latin and into uh, English. This is the last hour. As you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it's the last hour. So for John, the Antichrist, or the spirit of Antichrist, 
was the, the, the false teaching of Gnosticism, that Jesus had not physically, bodily risen and a bunch of other things that they held to. So the question is, if, if the New Testament writers believe that, were they off by 2,000 years? Do we believe biblical evidence or human construct? Futurists speak of these things as imminent, that the last days are about to start. Are we in the last day? They, that question comes up. The end times are about to start. Um, as they believe that it's something that um, will come in the near future or has perhaps already begun. Sometimes people will ask you, do you think that we're in the last days? You know, it's kind of awkward to answer, yeah, you know, but they started 2,000 years ago. <laughs> so I've been hearing this for 45 years. I've even said it. Um, the culture at large is familiar with, with our outlook on the future, by the way. You know, people read today in their familiar with the, you know, the videos and the declarations of preachers who are prophesying some pretty bad stuff. The culture is aware of how we look at things. And so it's probably not the best face that we want to project if we <laughs> want to get them to... Uh, I used to think that, you know, that it was an evangelistic tool to scare the crap out of somebody. Right? And I don't think it is. I think... Yeah. Um, so did the apostles miss it? Did they miss it? Were they confused? Uh, even Jesus. Um, the, the book of Revelation begins, you know, with the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his bondservants the things that what? Must soon take place. And he sent and communicated by his angel to his bondservant. Revelation 1.3. Blessed is he who reads uh, and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. And how near? Well, I, I used to think that the book of Revelation was written in 90 AD, roughly. I, I took that latter date, as many Christians do. I now believe differently. It had to be before the destruction of the temple. And, and for the reasons that I can't go back, I won't have time to elaborate on all that, but watch the first deep dive. I think, you know, I gave a pretty good presentation there. I don't want to use the word argument. Presentation, you know, people think argument is like you're being like uh, no, it's hard. argumentative. <laughs> but, but I think it, it, was, it was pretty convincing, right? And Jesus, you know, thought that it was pretty soon. I'm coming quickly. So the things that are in the book of Revelation are things that Jesus told uh, the churches through John, through the, the messengers, that were going to happen very quickly. Now, if it, if it wasn't, if, you know, and I've heard all sorts of jokes about this, ah, oh, you know, Jesus, you know, your definition of soon and... You know, I don't hold your breath. Uh, but I don't think quick you can ever interpret quickly as 2,000 years. <laughs> or more. <laughs> At the end of the book, he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angels to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place. That's where we get the word tachometer, you know, and tick, 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 you know, it's um, Revelation 20.10 and he said to me, do not seal up the words of this, the prophecy of this book for the time is near. Uh, when I put this together I, I scrunch the um, again, you know, behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me. Revelation 22.20 uh, 20. yes, I'm over and over and over again. So, you know, they're asking, what did Jesus say again? <laughs> uh, they weren't confused. So this, this is, I am, I am what's called a partial preterist. I'm not a full preterist. Other partial preterists, R.C. Sproul, you know, 
partial preterist, the, the late R.C. I don't know hold his, his views on tulip, but I, I think he's right on partial preterism. That's why I chew the meat, spit up the bones, right? And a lot of other teachers um, are partial pre Kenneth Gentry, uh, Gary DeMar. There's a lot of great stuff from people that are going to more detail than I'll oh, ever. So we were, they were living in the end times. Yes. But we aren't. Well, the last days. We're living in the last days. But by definition, okay, so the last the, days what, the when most people think of end times, uh -huh. they're, they're thinking of this because they're living in the end times prior to what happened in 70 AD, right. which was the d dramatic right. destruction of, of Judaism and, and the yeah. temple. And they, they, you didn't need temple sacrifices anymore. Yeah. Jesus is, was the sacrifice yeah. once and forever for the yeah. world. Yeah, We're not waiting for right. the, the rebuilding of a temple. Um, right. We're not waiting for uh, another, you know, we're not waiting for tribulation. We're not waiting for the revelation of an antichrist. Right. Uh, that is, you know, the, 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 the word preter means in Latin past, fulfilled already. But a full preterist goes even beyond that. We were talking about that in the car uh, with Terry. Um, well, full. <laughs> Kathy, was, <laughs> Kathy was drinking Starbucks and sleeping. Uh. Um, it, it has tremendous effect on her. So... So the, uh, the full preterist believes the second coming already happened. That's kind of like borderline, not borderline, it's probably like heresy. Orthodoxy has never held to that. Because, uh, you know, it's pretty clear when Jesus returns, it's dramatic. Every eye will see him. And, yeah, a lot of stuff that we can't really just... I'm very disappointed if that's true. What? I mean, if the second coming already happened, look at the world. I know. I know what happened. If Jesus came, where is he? Uh, <laughs> and, you know, so th this partial preterism is, you know, something that um, it is, um, I talked a little bit about, you know, some of the folks that well known teachers today Cal Pierce, Chris Ballatin, Bill Johnson. All of this um, is put out pretty, pretty well and thoroughly by Harold Eberly in this book. There's a lot of other books. Harold's is a, is a good one because he's, he's, like, he's not so deeply th theological you can't understand him. It's, it's, an, it's a good, right. easy read. It's a good communicator. Um, so let's look more closely um, at this. And I, I talked about this already. Where do, where do our ideas about the end times come from. And, you know, we mentioned this already, uh, the Schofield Bible, um, the late great planet Earth, these books that sold millions and millions of copies, uh, Edgar C. Wyson in 88 Reasons Why Christ Will Come Back in 1988. Uh, the, the very, you know, otherwise, you know, very widespread Calvary Chapel movement. Not every Calvary Chapel is heading in that direction, by the way, these days. Uh, American Dispensationalist Seminaries, Dallas, uh, Talbot, Moody, um, Western in Oregon, Denver, many, many uh, very, very well-known uh, dispensationalist teachers. Fuller was actually started to push back on that, among other things, with Charles Eldon Ladd. Eldon, uh, Char uh, Charles Eldon Ladd was, was teaching historic premillennialism and kingdom theology which helped to sort of give birth to the Vineyard Movement. Um, anyway, I showed charts like this already. Uh, let me just go to the 70 weeks. What about we go. the 70 weeks of Daniel? Or the really, you know, what's in question here is the last week, last the 70th week. Yeah. Um, what does the Bible say? Uh, let's deep dive into this a little bit. So at the start of chapter 9, and we'll get to it in a minute, um, we are introduced to Daniel's prayer for his people. And it's taking place in the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede. Uh, 539 B.C., 
or early 538, um, Daniel had been reading the prophet Jeremiah. In fact, he, um, this is what he had been reading, and we'll get to... I just want to give a little bit of context here on Jeremiah and Daniel, because they were contemporaries. Um, and Jer- in Jeremiah 30, it says, the Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, write down for the record everything I have said to you, Jeremiah, for the time is coming when I, I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah. So it's, Jeremiah is prophesying this. He's in Jerusalem. Two deportations have already taken place. Babylonians are taking Jews to Babylon in, in stages. Um, the, there will be ultimately three stages. Daniel and his friends are already in Babylon as this prophecy is be, being given. And they were, I believe Daniel was with the first uh, deportation that happened. They took the most... Um, the most talented uh, people, the, the smartest people, and sent them over there to, you know, to be part of the Babylonian uh, government that was spreading so rapidly. Um, so God is saying, look, I'm going to restore, even though he's watching the, 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 the worst of the worst days of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is under siege. Um, people are starving. I mean, you, you've read, uh, you've read Jeremiah, and then the follow-up, which is Lamentations, where he's looking at the, at the devastation and, uh, and, and the destruction of the city and describing it in, in pretty depressing detail. And, but God is saying to him, look, um, don't worry, I'm going to bring them home to this land that I gave to their ancestors, and they will possess it again. I, the Lord, have spoken. So and, and let me just continue. This is the message the Lord gave concerning Israel and Judah. This is what the Lord says. I hear cries of fear. There's terror and no peace. Now let me ask you a question. Do men give birth to babies? Then why do they stand there ashen-faced, hands pressed against their sides like a woman in labor? Verse 7. What, am I, what did I clip off here? <laughs> Somebody have a Bible? Yeah, I, I, when I cut and pasted the verse. Look at Jeremiah 30 and verse 7. Jeremiah 30, verse 7. The last, that one? The last, for the day is great. Yeah. Yeah. So he's saying, look, it, it, there's, there's going to be a really bad moment that's, that's about to come. In all of history, there's never been such a time of terror. Yet in the end, they will be saved. For in that day, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will break the yoke from the, their necks and snap their chains, and foreigners will no longer be their masters. So he's saying, look, even though you're going through a horrible time and it's going to get worse and you're going to be deported, you're, there's going to be a, you know, a, a exile, that time is, is going to end. Uh, but first, you know, there's this time of Jacob's trouble. So the question is like, when was Jeremiah prophesying? So we know pretty much, you know, historically based on these dates, you know, that... Um, you know, archaeological, liberal archaeology tries to always say, oh, we have no evidence of these kings. And then archaeologists will find like, you know, stamps and coins with the names of the kings. And inevitably, you know, the Bible is just always seems to be, um, you know, uh, upheld in its veracity. Um, So we know pretty much when he was prophesying, we know when Jerusalem fell, Jeremiah's ministry extends to and beyond the fall of Jerusalem in 586 BC, when the Babylonian Empire under King Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the city and the temple. We know this because of Lamentations, where Jeremiah laments this tragic event. And his prophecies include warnings 
about the coming destruction due to the people's unfaithfulness. So that time of Jacob's trouble is the time that's about to come when Nebuchadnezzar, you know, levels, destroys the city. It is not some period of time, 2,500 years in the future before the coming, the, the, you know, the, the return of Jesus. Um, but somehow dispensationalists do that. They propel it forward. More on that. Um, anyway, you know, he, Jeremiah likely survived. Nobody knows really where he wound up. And there's all these myths and, you know, uh, stories, interesting stories that he took the Ark of the Covenant. Um, Ethiopians and the Coptic church, I believe, and the Ethiopian church believes that he took it down to, I think, Addis Abada or whatever the name of that capital is in Ethiopia, and that the Ark of the Covenant is buried down there somewhere to be revealed at some moment in time. That would be interesting. Um, So what is the time of Jacob's trouble? Um, It refers to a period of great trial and suffering, and it's often understood as relating to the Babylonian captivity, a significant historical trauma for the Jewish people. No sacrifices, no temple worship. And really here is where like Judaism as we know it today um, becomes a, something else. How, how do they get forgiveness for their sins? Well, in modern day Judaism, that happens differently. It happens through their repentance and their good works. And, um, you know, there's many variants now of Judaism, but it changed when the temple was destroyed. The sacrifice was stopped. The pro- this prophecy acknowledges the severity of this period, but also assures deliverance. There's nothing here, this is the thing I wanted to get to, about seven years. Yet dispensationalist teachers say, oh, that time that, that Jeremiah is talking about, that's what Daniel's also, you know, that's the prophecy in Daniel uh, 9, and it's a seven-year period that's going to happen at the end of the age. But there's nothing about seven years. There's a word in Hebrew for seven. It doesn't appear there. Shabuah or Shiva. So, um, you know, these dates, I'm not so sure that that's all that interesting to you, but um, Je- Daniel and when, when Jeremiah was in Jerusalem witnessing the final days of the city, Daniel was a teenager, likely a teenager in Babylon. Here's a kind of a timeline of their ministries, how they overlap. Um, uh, you see Jeremiah's ministry in Jerusalem. And we know that he goes later to Egypt. Uh, Ezekiel's ministry is, is uh, uh, also happening, uh, overlapping at that time. Fall of Jerusalem, 586 B.C., and the Jews are allowed to return in 535. All of this is important. You're wondering, you know, why are you talking about all this stuff before you talk about Daniel 9? Because it's important when you're calculating these weeks. And there's all sorts of interesting calculations of it, but let's just read it. And then we'll go verse by verse into the, the meat of it, which is really verses 24 to 27. And how I see it. Okay. So, Daniel 9. Here we are. It only took us an hour to get to this point. But what's the hurry? Uh, It was the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede, the son of Ahasuerus, who became king of the Babylonians. During the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, learned from reading the word of the Lord as revealed to Jeremiah the prophet. What was he reading? Jeremiah 30, which we just read that Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years. He just read Jeremiah 30. He he was reading, he had those scrolls. It's pretty cool that they were able to take their Bibles with them. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. I also wore rough burlap and sprinkled myself with ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O Lord, you are a great and awesome God. You always fulfill your covenant and keep your promises of unfailing love to those who love you and obey your commands. So what's he praying for here? 
What's he? Buttering God up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> he's <laughs> claiming, but he's claiming the promise of Jeremiah 30. Oh, okay. He's claiming, thank God Baruch, the scribe, wrote all those things down. Imagine that, you know, like if he hadn't, right? So he's, he's, he's saying, God, here's what your word says. We want you to do this. But, you have, but we have sinned and done wrong. We have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. We have refused to listen to your servants, the prophets, who spoke on your authority to our kings and princes and ancestors and to all the people of the land. And it's like he's standing in the gap here. He's assuming responsibility. He probably was incredibly righteous and observant. I and mean, we know that, right? Um, but he's pleading on behalf of his people. Um, Lord, you're in the right, but as you see, our faces are covered with shame. This is true of all of us, including the people of Judah and Jerusalem and all Israel, scattered near and far, wherever you have driven us because of our disloyalty to you. O Lord, we and our kings, princes, and ancestors are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. I mean, deep, deep, almost like David level lament and brokenness. It's like a psalm. But the Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We've not obeyed the Lord our God, for we have not followed the instructions he gave us through the servants, his servants and the prophets. All Israel has disobeyed your instruction and turned away, refusing to listen to your voice. So now the solemn curses and judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured down on us because of our sin. You remember, you know, Deuteronomy, Moses like repeats and reminds him, you know, choose, and Joshua too, what, you know, choose you this day. It's your choice. You've kept your word and done to us and our rulers exactly as you warned. Never has been, there been such disaster as happened in Jerusalem. Every curse written against us in the law of Moses has come true. Yet we have refused to seek mercy from the Lord our God by turning from our sins and recognizing his truth. Therefore, the Lord has brought upon us the disaster he prepared. The Lord our God was right to do all these things, for we did not obey him. The Lord our God, you brought lasting, O Lord our God, you brought lasting honor to your name, by rescuing your people from Egypt in a great display of power. But we have sinned and are full of wickedness. In view of all your faithful mercies, Lord, please turn your furious anger away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. And all the neighboring nations mock Jerusalem and your people because of our sins and the sins of, your, of our ancestors. O oh, our God, hear your servant's prayer. Listen as I plead. For your own sake, O Lord, smile again on your desolate sanctuary. I mean, it's a good prayer for us, you know, as the church, you know. For your own sake, Lord, um, smile on us, you know, bring revival, pour out your spirit. Oh my God, lean down and listen to me. Open your eyes and see our despair. See how your city, the city that bears your name, lies in ruins. We make this plea, not because we deserve help, but because of your mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act for your own sake. Do not delay, O my God, for your people and your city bear your name. I went on praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, pleading with the Lord, my God, for Jerusalem, his holy mountain. As I was praying, Gabriel whom I had seen in the earlier vision, came swiftly to me at the time of the evening sacrifice. He explained to me, Daniel, I have come here to give you insight and understanding. The moment you began praying, a command was given, and now I am here to tell you what it was, for you are very precious to God. Listen carefully so that you can understand the meaning of your vision. Here it comes. A period of 70 sets of seven has been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish their rebellion, to put an end to their sin, 
to atone for their guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision, and to anoint the most holy place. Now listen and understand. Seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, comes. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong defenses despite the perilous times. We're going to come back and um, try to explain some of this. Oh my goodness, what did I do with my slides? Wait. Oh, okay. Oh, it's there. Okay. Okay. Where do we leave off? Verse 25. I read that, right? Yeah. Okay. After this period of 62 sets of seven, the anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing. And a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. The end will come with a flood and a war, and its miseries are decreed from that time to the very end. The ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one seven. But after half this time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. Now the question is, like dispensationalists say, that's Antichrist making a treaty. We're going to see in a moment. That's not the best explanation. He'll put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. As a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out on him. So, let's go to 1 Daniel 9.24. Seventy sets of seven have been decreed for your people in your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end to, of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So what is that? Where am I? Here's the interpretation. So 70 weeks, or the, the Hebrew word Shuba, Shabuah, are understood as weeks of years. Everybody's pretty clear on that. Nobody disagrees with that. So that's a total of 490 years. This period is seen as a time allotted for the fulfillment, complete fulfillment of certain key events. The end of Israel's transgressions, the making of atonement for iniquity, and the bringing in of everlasting righteousness. Why were Israel's transgressions ended? Because the people as a nation were destroyed. Not Judaism, it survives. But Israel as a nation is destroyed. Instead, what comes in? a joining of a creation of one new man in Christ, a sort of new Israel. Not replacement theology, because there's still a destiny for the Jewish people. That's not what this is teaching, or what I'm saying. In verse 25, so you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree, and I have charts coming up, you know, more graphic representation of this. Bear with me for a minute. You're to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. What are those times of distress? It was the time of the Roman uh, occupation, the Roman influence in Israel, which began in 63 BC, when I think the Roman general Pompey came in and took over. And from that point on, there were Roman troops occupying Israel. They were occupying during the time of Jesus and roughly 60 years before Jesus, the Roman troops had been there oppressing, collecting taxes, bullying. They wanted to go on. They wanted to you know, get all the land that Alexander the Great got, but Pompey was dealt a terrible defeat by the Parthians. Uh, and pushed back and humiliated. Uh, so the Romans were stopped. Um, they, they went as far as Syria, and they, they didn't go any further. So they weren't really as good as uh, uh, Alexander the Great. Um, so anyway, when was this fulfilled, this decree? Um, the decree is identified as one 
given by Artaxerxes to Ezra in the Bible, Ezra 7. From this decree, the coming of Messiah is said to be 69 weeks or 483 years. Some people work this out as roughly 26 AD. Now, you know that Jesus was probably not born in, you know, well, there's no year zero, but he wasn't born in one. He was probably born, according to historians, more like three or four BC. So at 26 AD would be roughly the time when he begins his public ministry, when the Holy Spirit comes on him and he's propelled into the desert, then he comes out preaching, the kingdom of the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That's the beginning of, that's Messiah, the anointed one. What does anointing mean? It means anointed by the Holy Spirit. So that when is the anointed one revealed? Roughly 483 years after Artaxerxes decrees. That's a pretty remarkable prophecy. You don't have to get more fancy about that right there. I mean, that's amazing. Um, and some have worked it out, you know, incredibly even like to the day. I don't know if we need to do that. Um, but um, anyway, Daniel 26. And after the, is this, is this coming across? Is it, we'll see some charts in a minute. This is kind of <laughs> numbing to the, all, this, all of this uh, detail. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. What's that? His death. His, death. His, crucifixion. Yeah. His crucifixion. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who's that? That's Titus. The people, who are the people? The Romans. The prince is to come. Titus, who comes in and destroys devastates the city um, and even more completely than Nebuchadnezzar ever did and by the way it was again even more so um, in 120 AD its end will come with a flood even to the end there will be war desolations are determined so the cutting off of Messiah is the crucifixion I think flood here is meaning that it, it just suddenness you know it was like destruction coming. I don't think like a water flood. I don't think it's referring to a water flood. Okay. The end will come like a flood meaning um, like when we say the enemy will come Yeah. Like that war, the the Jewish war, you know, lasted and you can read this in like Josephus and the war of the Jews. It lasted almost like almost 4 years. Some think it was 3 and a half years, tribulation, right? And and then at, in the end, the Romans finally broke in and they were so enraged because of their losses and the stubbornness and the fierce resistance that the Jewish uh, rebellion had put up that they just went berserk. Um, and and it, was, it was hideous, the, the details that Josephus gives. So, um, yeah, the city is destroyed. And then verse 27, here's probably the most difficult of the verses to interpret. Um, I think the NIV or the NLT gets kind of interpretive here. Because I, I think the NLT is trying to give the more kind of classic seven-year tribulation at the end of the age perspective. But other more literal translations like um, at the NASV or the ESV. Do you, what do you have there, Cheryl? Daniel 9.27? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to look it up in the um, NASB. NRSB says, uh, he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week, he shall make sacrifice and offering cease. And in their place shall be an abomination that desolates until the decreed end is poured out upon the desolator. Right, so um, one week refers to the final 70th week. And he is often identified as Jesus who by his death puts an end to sacrifice and grain offering. So it's not that an antichrist at the end of you know, during the tribulation comes in, desecrates the temple, and stops the sacrifice in a rebuilt temple. 
So you see, for this reason, if we interpret it this way, this is why the dispensationalist must hold to a rebuilding of the temple. Because otherwise there's nothing to destroy, no sacrifice to stop. But can you imagine like the re-initiating of animal sacrifices? Aren't they preparing for that with the red heifer? Yeah, but now you've got how many Jewish people are going to be sacrificed for? There are 16 million Jews in the world. Can you imagine the, the, just the, how this will appear to the world. That you're like, you're killing all of these sheep and lambs and doves. How exactly is that going to happen? The animal activists will have a fit. A fit. <laughs> I mean, this would be like a public relations nightmare for any country. And I know that, you know, they try to explain that as, oh, well, but God, right? But, okay, um, it's much, I think, cleaner to say that the he is Jesus who by his death puts an end to the need for sacrifice and grain offering. And then in his judgment allows for and kind of brings in, because remember he... He, remember what he said in chapter 23 of, of Matthew. You, you know, your house will be left to you desolate. So he's kind of enabling the Romans to do what they did, which was to make the house desolate. So there's no need to interpret this as a future antichrist. Any comments or um, difference of opinion? I... Um, so the abomination that makes desolate, it's pretty clear, and I'll show you in, uh, if, if anything is clear in the Gospels, because all three evangelists of the, the synoptic evangelists, Mark, Luke, and Matthew, talk about the abomination, the, they quote Jesus, saying that the Daniel's uh, prophecy will be fulfilled when this desolation comes. So it's not a, they're not talking about a future Antichrist, but we'll get to that. We'll look at those verses. So here's kind of, you know, a graphic presenta- represent, or presentation of the what, what, what the, 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 the dispensationalist view, right. Uh, so they have, they have 483 years, and then they say the crucifixion, and then there's this 2,000 year delay, this big parenthesis, the church age, a big surprise, you know, God's plan B or whatever. And then they push the 70th week all the way to the end. And they talk about a great tribulation that's going to happen. Temple rebuilt, Antichrist is revealed, and he makes a pact with Israel then he breaks that pact and he betrays them and stops the sacrifice. They have that, they push that into the 70s. This is classic dispensationalist futurist reading. Um, you know, this, okay. Any thoughts, <laughs> comments? Um, the way that, that I just uh, interpreted it here is more of the, the preterist, um, and again, Praetor already fulfilled. Um, so you have this decree, it adds up to, those, those 483 years adds up to Jesus' baptism, and then this final period of time that includes the events of 70 AD, including a, you know, a, a pretty bad tribulation. Right? So why, again, why push that? You have, you have the, des- the, the, the abomination of desolation. And, and again, you know, we read all those verses and quotes before and explanations. Um, let me just go back to Jesus' own words. Um, skip that chart here. The day is coming. Now Jesus is talking to the people there 
in present with him in roughly, I don't know, 27, 28 AD, when you will see, you will see what the prophet spoke about, the sacrilegious object that causes desecration. Reader, pay attention. Then those in Judea must flee to the hills. If this applies to a future generation, 2,000 years in the future, then what? Only the people in Judea can flee? What about the rest of the world? Because the dispensationalists say that this great tribulation will affect the whole world. Well, Jesus doesn't say anything about the rest of the world. He says he's speaking to an event that's going to occur there in the Holy Land. Uh, In the same way, when you see all these things, you know that his return, and again, we explained that return uh, in the apocalyptic language of the prophets coming in judgment uh, and really allowing all the things that that happen. I tell you the truth. Now, this is the crux of the matter here. This is where the rubber meets the road, this verse. And I'm going to argue in the 10 minutes that I have left, that everything changes. Because you say, well, what about the second coming? When does he talk about the second coming? We'll deal with that in a minute. But, and this this verse has been a stumbling block for many people. I remember I I quoted to you, (coughs) well, let me go on for a minute. He said, this generation, this one, will not pass from the scene until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will not disappear. Every single time the word generation appears in in Matthew, he is speaking to a present generation, not something, you know, in the future. And it appears Matthew 11, Matthew 12, 41, you can look these up later. The same word, the queen of the south will rise up with this generation, this generation, this generation seeks a sign. These things will come upon this generation. So this is why C.S. Lewis said, because he thought this verse couldn't possibly be, Jesus would have been wrong. When was his, you know, he got it wrong. His timing's wrong. He called it the most embarrassing verse in the Bible. Say what you like. We shall be told. This is a quote from him. I read this before. Um, The apocalyptic beliefs of the first Christians have been proven to be false. It is clear from the New Testament that they all expected the second coming in their own lifetime. I don't think so, Mr. Lewis. And worse still, they had a reason and one which you will find very embarrassing. Their master had told them so. He shared and indeed created their delusion. I wonder if he wrote this essay before he got saved. He shared and and he created their delusion. He said in so many words, this generation shall not pass till you see all these things be done. And he was wrong. He clearly knew no more about the end of the world than anyone else. It is certainly the most embarrassing verse in the Bible. I think Lewis goes on. I got to read more of the context of that to say that, you know, Jesus was limited in his earthly knowledge. I don't think so. I think those things were seen by the very people that he's spoken to. They saw those things. And he detailed, notice that he details them very carefully. Then later on, in the second part of chapter 24, he says, of that day, no one knows. Of what day? Of the second coming. That day, then he begins to say, will be like what? Like in the days of Noah. So the second coming will be like in the days of Noah. We'll read that in a moment. But I'm just jumping the gun here a little bit. What were the days of Noah like? They were eating, drinking, partying, and then suddenly... This is why I think, you know, it's pretty clear what Jesus is saying here. The second coming is unpredictable. It's imminent. And then... The rest of that chapter, and chapter 25, he's warning his servants, don't be be saying, hey, I got a lot of time. I can be like a hypocrite. I can live, I can ignore the Lord and do whatever I want. All those parables are about that. He says, don't be like that. Be like the 
the virgins who trimmed their, their lamps and filled. So it's, he's saying, be ready because you don't know when that time will come, when the master will come. Uh, I told you about Bertrand, Bertrand Russell was probably the most well-known, you know, he's an atheist, not a Christian. And he wrote a book, Why I'm Not a Christian, and other essays on religion and related subjects. Maybe I got that C.S. Lewis quote wrong and I'm quoting Bertrand Russell. I got to get that right. But I don't think so. Um, he once said that the reason why he couldn't become a Christian is because Jesus was not reliable. People jump on that. And he based his assertions on Matthew 24. So dispensationalists say, yeah, you know, it, that the, the, the only problem with you is that it wasn't that generation. It was the generation that would see those things. And so they throw it off into the future. I did. But every time I came to that verse, I got, it really gave me the heebie-jeebies. Uh, yeah. Like you, you quoted the last deep dive, you know, history that shows that all those things that Jesus said, even, even like signs in the heavens and all those things, yeah. that those were actually fulfilled. But how would we, being born, you know, whatever? Well, we have Josephus, you know. We do, I, know we not, yeah. I know we do, but yeah. people, whoever has studied, would have to have. Yeah. Read, yeah, that those those things, yeah, and then the when did this theology come about? The of dispensationalist the theology. Yes, because it, it's recent. We were right? just talking about that in the car on the way here. John Nelson 1800s. Darby in the eighteen hundreds, eighteen thirty. Okay, so nobody believed that before that. Before that, nobody held to dispensation. The no. dispensational no. didn't, didn't exist. They claim that it did. They have all these interesting arguments. <laughs> where they tie it into first century. But it, it really became popular with John Nelson Darby. And then he passed it on to others. Uh, Moody bought into it. Moody Theological, Sem uh, Moody Bible Institute. And then later, the big boost for dispensationalism was C.I. Schofield and the Schofield Bible. So of those four boxes, if they didn't, if the fourth one, dispensationalism, didn't come out until 1800s, what did they believe in the early prior, 1800s? Prior to that, yeah, I think most I think most people were probably Amil. Uh, they were they they certainly didn't hold to an end time tribulation, um, but they you know some people probably you know, I I don't know that much about that period of time, but I I think post millennialism was pretty popular, that especially during the great missionary pushes of the 1700s and the 1800s. We've got to go take the world for Jesus. So it was a lot healthier, yeah. a lot healthier perspective than what we have now. Is hey, let's chill, man. They're gonna see. They're gonna get their comeuppance. You know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> they have no idea what's gonna come on them, but we know. <laughs> that I'm just telling you what I thought. You know, I talk to people about Jesus, but I, I always thought, well, they're gonna find out. Instead of you know just kind of you know pressing in and. Being more to the work of the kingdom. Thank you. Thank you. About the, the the gospel will be preached to the ends of the earth, and, and then the end. And will then come. the end will come. And then the end will come. Yeah. Well, we we actually looked at that as the end being the the end of Israel as we know it. You remember in the first deep dive. That's a but but. But anyway, we're supposed to preach the gospel. I remember when, when I came into the vineyard, that's what really struck me like a lightning bolt. That I'm not waiting for, I saw kingdom as entirely future. For me, the kingdom was when Jesus returned to establish his kingdom. I had no idea of the already but not yet. That we can do the stuff. That we can pray for people, the sick. That we can, um, you know, we can preach release to the captives and healing and had no perspective on that. And, but also the Holy Spirit was, so when will Jesus return? I got five minutes. When will, he, when will he return to the earth visibly and bodily? Um, remember the three questions, right? 
Tell us when these things will be. This is the NASB. And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So they asked three questions. The end of the age, the culmination or the completion. They used a different Greek word there. It wasn't eschatos. Suntaleia. So notice the shift in the object of his words in the Olivet Discourse. It happens in verse 35. Remember, there were no verses and no chapter differences. Even so you, when you see these things, recognize that he is near, right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation, the one I'm speaking to, will not pass away until these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall not pass away. I don't want to talk about that again. What happened? Oh, wait. I want to get to I want to get to Matthew. What happened to Matthew? We may have to pull our Bibles out here. Oh, here we go. Okay. Can somebody read verse 36? <laughs> what did I do with verse 36? Matthew 24, verse 36? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. But, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Okay. Isn't that interesting? All of a sudden he goes, in answer to the third question, when will be the end of the age? But of that day and hour, no one knows. He just finished giving... 30 verses of detail about what will happen. Abomination of desolation, all of this stuff, you know, detail about what this generation would experience, a devastation, uh, you know, all of these things, warning them. But now, in answer to question three, he goes, of that day and hour, no one knows. Similar to what he says to the disciples in Acts 1.8. When the disciple says, are you going to establish your kingdom at this time? In other words, are you going to return and sit on the throne bodily and physically in Jerusalem? What was his answer? Those things that times and the seasons are not for you to know, but only my Father in heaven. So, I don't know why Jesus chose to answer it that way. But there's a definite, you see the shift there. And then he goes, when the Son of Man returns, it won't be like the, de- the destruction that I just uh, described of Jerusalem. It won't be like that. It will be sudden. It won't be signs that you can discern. Things, you know, the, the, the Israel surrounded by armies. Luke described the abomination of desolation as the Roman armies. Luke 21, chapter 21. You can read that. I read that before. All of a sudden now, he says, it's going to be like Noah's day. Ah, you know, he's building a, you know, never rained before, you know. And they're partying and, you know. And then he, he's describing his second coming differently. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered the boat. And Noah, by the way, was preaching, right? He was righteous. The Bible describes him as a righteous preacher. Uh, people didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. This is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. But I tell you this truth. Oh, that's going back now. What did I do here? Oh, I just jumbled up all these verses. But just in time to end. <laughs> Any <laughs> I'm sorry. I I I put verses um Oh, I know what I was doing there at the end. Yeah, this is from this is from all the other evangelists. Um he Mark says the same thing. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass away for all these things, again, details. But then when he talks about his second coming, it, it will be like in the days of Noah, right? And, and then, you know, without even going into uh, chapter, the end of chapter 24, 
uh, it goes down to what, verse 51, something like that, where he tells what, parable after parable about what? Servant, be ready. Mm. Master's going away for a long time. Master's going away for a long time. Mm. Be ready. And that his coming could, could be at any moment. You don't know when the master is going to return. And, and by the way, what's interesting about all that language, because the dispensationalist says, you know, that the, the rapture will be a catching up. The word doesn't mean catching up. It, it means to really go up to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to meet the Lord in the air, and then we're going to come down with him. That matches the language of the virgins who had their lamps filled who go out to meet the Lord, the, the, bri- the, bri- the bridegroom. And then they all go into the place that the bride, the bridegroom had prepared. Th- this is, you know, this is the, the, just the beauty of that, you know, chapter 25 and not separating it from all the apocalyptic stuff. Um, Luke says the same, I tell you, this generation will not pass away. But then they all go on to explain um, his second coming as being sudden, imminent, and, you know, unpredictable. Yeah, only the Father knows. What is the Father thinking? (laughs) Well, I know that he's thinking the best. Right? Because he's good. We have, we have to trust that he's got purposes that are for good. We wish that he would just come back. I don't know about you, but I pray. He, but G- another, so, and it could be eminent, but it also could be another thousand years. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> what do we have to lose, right? Because I think yeah. if we have a, a, a hopeful eschatology, we're not going to take a defeatist perspective and just say the world and the devil are just going to beat up on, on us until he comes back. Our commands from the Lord are to, are to reign and rule until he comes back with what he's given us. What has he given us? He's going to ask for an accounting of what he's given us. Not everyone is given the same. To whom much is given, much will be required. Um, but we're supposed to do with what, you know, be faithful with what he's given us until he returns. And then to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 15. We will, until the, the resurrection, the first resurrection that occurs at the beginning of the millennial reign, until that resurrection, which we will all hopefully be a part of, If we die, we go to be with the Lord in paradise. Jesus said that to the uh, penitent. uh, Today you will be with me in paradise, not floating in a cloud somewhere. It's it's. And then Paul talked about the body that we will inhabit will be different, but you know it won't be like the final resurrection body that we get at the the last trumpet. The last trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised, and we who are alive will. Caught up to me. Well, that's that's not me. But anyway, this is what you know the premillennial kingdom view. This is also Harold Everly's chart. That's his perspective. Um, kingdom growing. Isn't that what it says in in Daniel two, Daniel four, um, Isaiah nine, and other places? His kingdom as an ever-increasing kingdom, expanding kingdom, and it's now driven through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Um, And then Jesus returns to begin um, the millennial reign. And I think that's the time, one of the reasons why I think that millennial reign has to be a literal thousand years on the earth with Jesus ruling over resurrected saints, but a lot of people who are not yet bowed the knee 
is first all the, the land promises to Israel. Has Israel ever lived in peace? All of the promises that were given to Israel in the Old Testament, you know, especially, you know, through prophets like Jeremiah, who were saying, look, all of this happened, but the Lord will do. Th-. Those things were never fulfilled. Even some people say, oh, yeah, they were. Maccabean period, you know, 180 years. Not really. There were wars and they were always fighting enemies. And they've never occupied the fullness of the land that was promised through the Abrahamic covenant from the Mediterranean to the Euphrates. Not literally. So that's, I think all of these things happen. Jesus demonstrates his righteousness to the world. Many people I think will embrace and be saved. And, you know, we're told that people go up to Jerusalem during that time at, at the time of the, um, the Feast of Tabernacles. And there's a, there's a lot of detail about what occurs during that millennial reign. Anyway, any comments or observations? Thank you for those who have been patient with us online. And uh, I hope this was more than what I did last time. Uh, I tried to explain. Yeah, David. Well, I, I just have to say, from my perspective, um, it makes me feel totally motivated, totally excited. I want to be a part of the expanse of his kingdom. I want to do the work, you know, it, and, it, and it, it's motivating for me to, be, to, to serve Jesus and to serve the kingdom in that way. Yeah. And, and it, it's such a different feeling than when... I used to sit there at Calvary Chapel when I was 16 years old during the Jesus movement, and it was like people were excited about the terrible things that were happening in the earth. They were almost rejoicing about bad things happening because it meant, oh, Jesus is going to come soon. But it's like, wait a minute, you shouldn't be rejoicing that horrible things are happening. That's not... That's not what, who God is. That's not what he's doing. Or and even maybe if, even if they weren't re- rejoicing, just kind of being passive about it because oh, they oh, felt they that it was rejoicing. the inevitable. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know I've seen that. Yeah. And may, I, I probably was guilty of, of some of that. I may not have voiced it that way, but inwardly I'm thinking, oh yeah, he's getting close. And, and, but, and what I saw that theology bring is a passiveness and, and a resignation and people just, instead of trying to expand the kingdom and grow and be better people, they, they just, I mean, I know people that got married too early, they dropped out of college, they did all kinds of things because what's the point? Jesus, Took on debt? Jesus, yeah, Jesus is going to be coming back here any minute and so... We need to worry about our retirement. Yeah. Jesus <laughs> Don't save any money. Uh, um, this is really interesting, like if, if you read chapter 23, and Jesus, especially Jesus' pronouncements at the end to the leaders of Israel, not all Israel was buying into this, but he was speaking to them as, an, as a nation, they rejected him. Um, and he weeps over them. And then he pronounces the woes. And then he's saying, this is what's going to happen in the beginning of chapter uh, 24. But then... Everything changes after verse 37. Read that later. And he starts talking to them. But you, be on the alert, for you don't know which day your Lord is coming. Well, if if the tribulation is future, and it begins with the, you know, if you know you're in the middle of the tribulation when the Antichrist, as the dispensationalists say, makes a pact with Israel. That's what they say the middle of the, you know, three and a half years of the seven years. Then you do know you got three and a half years to go. And you remember if you, if you read the Left Behind series, I read every single book. <laughs> the so-called tribulation saints knew that the clock had started ticking. So then how does verse 42 apply to them? Be on the alert for you don't know which day your Lord is coming. 
You know the way that uh, that that um, the authors um, explain that. I forget the name of the. the oh gosh, Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins. Jenkins. They 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 came up with this like. <laughs> that's when I kind of stopped reading them. You know, I I said no. Oh, this the the last two or three books were ridiculous because they they added all these days and all this complexity so that they wouldn't be certain of what day he would actually appear. But you can count it down if that's the way it goes down, right? But be sure of this, verse 43, if you knew the head of the house, if the head of the house had known at what time the thief was coming, so he's speaking here to the, to the, Lord, of the, 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 the Lord of the servants. Verse 45, who then is the faithful and sensible slave? So after verse 37, everything changes. You don't know how, when this day is going to come. Be ready, be ready, be ready. Blessed is the servant whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. When does that happen? During the millennial reign. And, and in, in, in Luke 19 or in other places, he, he's telling the disciples, you're going to reign with me. You're going to rule with me. Um. Yeah, it, we, we can't separate chapter 25 or the end of 24. is so, so relevant. The parable of the talents. Um, when the Son of Man comes in glory, all his angels with him, he shall sit in his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him. You know, all of this stuff is just amazing, but there's no time tonight. Father, um, we pray... Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. Amen. Lord, help us also to just maintain a lot of humility about these things. And um, because we're always reading more and learning more and hearing more from you. Um, but also, Lord, that we would have a love um, for those who don't know you. And just fill us in, uh, with this your spirit that we would we would be ready um, and that we would, we would be people who are anticipating the any moment return of their master. Um, and we need the oil in our lamps, that our lamps might be lit and our wicks to be trimmed and ready. We need you, Holy Spirit. Lord, forgive us any arrogance, any, any pride, um, and Lord, um, we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks for coming. Thank you. Good job. And uh, yeah, so the next, I think the next deep dive, we really got to go more into 24, 25. And, um, and, and then how does Revelation break down? That's a... That's probably two or three deep dives there. Um, what does the partial preterist do with the book of Revelation? We will soon find out. <laughs> right?